from generation to industrial and railway traction power to data centers. ETAP is powering the world from design to analysis to operation and optimization. Let's take a closer look how. The electrical digital twin life cycle we see here include automate and control, operate and optimize, monitor and predict, but this would not be possible without a strong foundation for electrical design and power systems analysis. Today's presentation will focus on that design and analysis foundation. At the core of ETAP's Digital Twin Foundation is the multi-dimensional platform. This is the same platform used by thousands of engineers around the world for modeling both greenfield and brownfield projects. It provides the end user with the ability to digitize and visualize an electrical network in multiple ways such as a geospatial view of the electrical grid imported from an existing ArcGIS or ESRI database, saving hundreds of hours on recreating the model from scratch. On the left side is what most of us are used to seeing, a typical radial view representation of the single line diagram or logical network view. And on the right side is the network view. This provides the engineer and operator with a very clear organized view of a very large transmission and distribution network. Planning engineers have all three views available for quickly visualizing and performing analysis, all while displaying study results right on the selected view. Second is configurations. This is how we model multiple operating conditions or scenarios such as emergency, maintenance, winter or summer loading, various tie and switching scenarios. Um, for those of you who perform arc flash analysis studies, you understand the importance of being able to model multiple operating conditions for a site and evaluating all of them to find the worst case scenario. Third is the data revisions. This is what we use to model proposed new changes or modifications such as future site expansions, what if scenarios, and mitigation studies before they are, they are approved. I will now pass it over to Jeremy as he covers the design digital journey. Thank you, Victor. Here we see the start of our roadmap, which begins with modeling. ETAP is based on a multi-dimensional database, which allows for unlimited graphical presentations, status configurations, data revisions, and time series analysis. Not only are you able to take advantage of our multi-dimensional database, but we also allow for collaborative modeling with NetPM, which allows your team to model the one-line diagram at the same time where you can update rating information, add or remove devices, and run different studies and see these changes in real time. We also allow for data collection with our ETAP app which exports your one-line diagram into a tablet or iPad and you can compare or update your design ratings with your as-found ratings. To begin modeling in ETAP, I can enable auto build, which allows for equidistant spacing between my devices and only allows appropriate devices to be connected to each other. I'm going to start out by building a small model and I can just click on the devices that I want to add into my single line diagram. I can quickly add as many motors as I'd like to this bus. I can add in my protective device and I can add in my cable. Now let's take a look at our libraries. I'm going to open up the circuit breaker, open up the library. So we have three different types that you can choose from, molded case, power CB, and insulated case. Based on the type that you select, then the manufacturers will update on the right hand side here. And once you select the manufacturers, then we'll have all the models associated with that manufacturer in the middle here. Once we select the model, at the very bottom, we'll have all the solid state trip devices associated with this model. 
Now going into the cable, we open up our cable library. So we have a huge list that you can choose from. So the cables are based on the frequency, type, voltage, class, and more. And um, say if we wanted to sort based on just the source, say we're looking for an air guard cable, then we can further narrow down the cable library to just the source with air guard. Now going into the motor, I'm going to go into the nameplate information. So we can start filling in the data, but say if we don't have the additional information here, then we can then select the typical nameplate data, and the, this table will update accordingly. Say if I wanted to also uh, use the same rating information for motor 19 and 20, I can copy the element data to my clipboard, and then I can choose from this pull-down menu, motor 19, paste that information, or I can use the right arrow to increment up to motor 20 and paste the information as well. Once the modeling is completed, we can then proceed with model validation by running different analysis tools such as low flow and short circuit, protection and selectivity, AC, DC, and high voltage arc flash, cable opacity and sizing, underground raceways for our direct buried cables and duct banks, ground grid protection. We can also verify that the dimensions of our devices are sized correctly. And then we can create multiple output reports and compare them with our evaluators and analyzers. Lastly, we can create a macro to run a single study or multiple studies within the same project or multiple projects. Here I have opened another pre-built project that already has all the device rating information filled out. I'm going to run a quick load flow calculation. You'll see the various real and reactive power flow results populated on the single line as well as the voltage percentage at each bus. We can also change the units to show the real power only, reactive power only, apparent power, current, and apparent and current uh, as the units showing on the single line. At the bottom, we see our critical and marginal alerts. For our critical alerts, we see that circuit breaker 15 was overloaded with a rating limit of 10 amps and operating at 3,535%. We will definitely need to resize this breaker. Below that, you will see our marginal results. It looks like all of our buses were running at an under voltage condition. These alerts are based on percent thresholds that you have set in the low flow study case. Any device that exceeds 100% loading will generate a critical error and anything between 95 and 100% will generate a marginal error. To the right we have thresholds for our buses and over and excited thresholds for our generators and utilities. You could also create various scenarios using our multi-dimensional database where you can change the rating for existing devices. I have a preloaded revision where I have updated the size of the overloaded circuit breaker when we first ran load flow. On the left hand side we see all the revisions that were made for this project. I'm going to select base and I'm going to select the updated setting for circuit breaker 15. If we wanted to dive deeper we can see the exact changes that were made by selecting properties. And in here we can see um, that I increased the frame size and also the continuous current for this device. We can then apply the new revision to the single line diagram and rerun our low flow calculation. So with this correction, it looks like circuit breaker 15 is no longer overloaded. We can also create scenarios where you can change the status for breakers, switches, and operating conditions for motors, utilities, and other loads. After applying the configuration, we see that there's a circuit breaker that's open since the right-hand side of our project is de-energized. We can edit all of our configurations using the configuration manager. We'll, we'll have all of our preset configurations showing and also the different statuses for our devices. We can also create a copy of the same single line diagram within the same project by creating a new presentation. On the left hand side we're going to set the, the breaker statuses back to normal. On the right hand side we're going to keep that breaker open. So what we can do is rerun the low flow study and compare the output power flow results side by side. We also have other presentations within this project. For instance, we have our relay view, which will show all the relays that were hidden in the previous study view. This next presentation shows you all the same devices, but they're oriented to the left. Also, you'll notice that the color has changed drastically. 
We can change the color schemes through our theme editor, which allows you to fully customize your single line diagram view. You can change the background color, the grid lines, the color for three phase devices, which includes composite networks, result annotations. You can also change the colors for single phase elements. You can also select the result precision based on the number of decimal places you'd like to output the results. We can also change the voltage level colors, assign certain networks as areas and color coordinate based on this. Uh, we can change the color for grounding connection lines, for grounding and earthing, and last you can change the font for your results and input annotations. In short circuit we can run a three phase and single phase device duty study, half cycle 1.5 to 4 and 30 cycle for line to ground, line to line, line to line to ground, and three phase faults. Once we run our device duty calculation, we can check our alert view and see our marginal and critical errors based on the percent thresholds that we set in the study case for short circuit. We can now generate an output report that can be exported to a Crystal Reports viewer, PDF, Microsoft Word, rich text format, or Microsoft Excel. You can generate a complete report, an input report that shows the ratings of all your input devices, a result report for your short circuit study, and an overall summary report. We'll take a look at the complete report, which includes the inputs, results, and the summary. This first page is a summary of all the buses in the project. Next, we're looking at the adjustment tolerances if they were used for the study. Here are our input ratings for our devices. In the middle, we have our short circuit results that were calculated during the study. At the end, we have a summary of our interrupting and momentary duty calculations. We can also see our results in a tabulated view through our analyzer. In this, we can see the output results that were generated during our short circuit study. In here, we can also compare multiple output reports, which will actually come in handy when we're talking about ArcFlash. Just like low flow and short circuit, once we run the arc flash study, we can see the results populate on the single line diagram. We see the energy level, arc flash boundary, incident energy, and fault clearing time. If we want to view the steady state arc flash current on the one line, we can open up the display options and check this feature. This menu will also allow you to include more input rating annotations to your devices. We can check the desired annotations that we would like to see and it will update accordingly. Here I have opened up the study case. We can include additional options when running the arc flash study, like calculating the low terminal fault current for a motor, include impedances for medium voltage and low voltage motors. At the bottom, we can pick and choose which buses we'd like to fault all in one view rather than faulting each one individually on the single line. In the Methods tab, we can choose which standard we'd like to apply, like IEEE 1584-2018. We can also choose the arc fault method if we'll be evaluating a system over 15 kV. Now since we are using the IEEE 1584-2018 standard, we can open up the Enclosure Editor and specify the dimensions and also select which bus or protective device belongs to this enclosure. On the right, we see which devices are in this enclosure, the enclosure type, the electrode configuration, and the dimensions. Let's take a look at the analyzer. To the left, we see all of the generated output reports based on the various scenarios that were already ran for this project. On the right, we see information for the elements we have selected on the left-hand side. We can include additional devices and information by checking more of the options on the left. If we select the incident energy box and select the worst case, this will show the worst case based on the output report. This comes in handy when you are generating the arc flash labels for your project. We can then generate a label for the worst case incident energy for a single device or multiple devices. Here we have a huge template list that you can select from with labels from Brady, Avery, Durlabel, and more. On this label, we see the arc flash boundary, incident energy, working distance, energy level, shock hazard, and appropriate working distances. You can also generate custom labels, work permits, and data sheets for your devices. We can create time current curves by selecting the network we would like to evaluate. Here on the bottom left, we have the network shown. I'm going to add a label to this fuse so that we can see the settings. If I move the fuse curve to the left or right, we can see all the available sizes. I'm going to use the zoom tool so I can take a closer look at the TCC curve. 
If I move the zoom box up and down, you'll see that it updates on the right dynamically. If we wanted to see the time difference between two different curves, we can use the time difference tool to see the delta. This also moves and updates dynamically. I can also include a crosshair that can trace a curve and show the current and time along the curve. You can create unlimited TCC curves and they'll be saved in this pull down menu. Here are some other TCCs that were created for this project. To customize our TCCs, we can go into our plot options. We can change the axis where we can set the scale of the X and Y coordinates. We can change our grid lines. We can change the line color of the major and minor grid. We can update the legend showing at the bottom. We can also assign a color for the different device curves. We can use the design device assessment tool to troubleshoot and verify that we have entered data for all of our protective devices. If any of the information is missing, then we will get an entry for that specific device with a detailed description of what needs to be reviewed. Let's take a look at sequence of operation. So this is a fault insertion tool where when we add a fault to our project, we will see an animation that provides the order in which our protective devices will trip. This viewer shows a summary of which device tripped first, and it goes down the list sequentially. It shows at what time each device tripped, how long it tripped for, and the condition. We can use our protection zone viewer to see the zones of protection for this motor. From here, we can see the full list of all the devices connected to the motor, and then we can create a time current curve based on these devices. You can also create a device settings report for all the devices in your project. The device settings report will show all the settings for your protected devices, such as fuses, inline overload relays, low voltage circuit breakers, solid state trip devices, overcurrent relays, overload heaters, overload relays, and reclosers. If we'd like to verify that our protection and coordination meets our customized design criteria or industry guidelines like the NEC handbook, we can run star auto evaluation for the entire project or a portion of the project and verify that it meets these guidelines. The green check marks mean that we passed the evaluation based on the selected rules. The red X's mean that we failed in the evaluation due to a violation from the rules. The orange exclamation points mean that we observed the conditions which needs attention as it may change the results. On the right hand side we are showing the condition for the status of that device. This table also works dynamically. For instance, we can take a look at this cable and we see that it has some violations. We can update the time current curve on the right hand side and when we pass the evaluation, the status will automatically be updated in this table. Star Auto also has a special tab for arc flash. It is based on C area plots and the evaluation of arc resistant equipment. Underground duct banks allows for cable derating analysis specifically steady state temperature calculation, uniform opacity calculation, uniform temperature calculation, cable sizing, and transient temperature calculation. You can specify the soil type surrounding the raceway and the soil type inside the raceway. You can also specify the location of the conduit and also open up the cable editor if you'd like to make additional changes to the cable. If you'd like to add in an existing cable from our single line diagram, we can select it from this pull down menu and it'll get added into this conduit. The cable also doesn't need to be existing. We can actually add a brand new cable as well. We can also move the steam pipe around the raceway and we can see how that affects the uniform opacity calculation. In the first view, we saw there is more thermal heating around cable 3, but when we move the steam pipe to the left, we saw there is more heating around cable 4. We can also graph the transient temperature calculation plots. We can select a single conduit or multiple conduits and graph each one individually or combine the plots. Last, we have our cable magnetic field evaluation tool. This calculator determines the magnetic field intensity produced by each conductor in the raceway. Ground grid analysis is used to determine the maximum allowable current for specified conductors and also the step and touch potentials. 
Here we see the grid in a 3D plane. We can rotate it along the x-axis. Below that is the same grid, but we're viewing it from an aerial perspective. To the top right, we see our conductors, rods, and multi-soil layers. After running our ground grid calculation, we're able to see the calculated and tolerable volts for the touch and step potential. We can then plot the absolute touch and step voltages in a 3D plot type. Here's the plot for our step potential profile. Here's the plot for our touch potential profile. And here's the last plot for our absolute potential profile. Let's now continue the advanced design solutions and more complex analysis such as time series unified load flow analysis used in renewable studies where generation output is highly variable and demand data is available from historic measurements. Solve unified power flow taking into account both AC and DC networks over a function of time and produce load duration curves. Number two, transient motor starting. Calculate actual acceleration time and analyze the impact on the rest of the system, including the ability to compare between multiple motor starter types. Next is power quality analysis. Reduce nuisance trips and power, power factor limit violations by performing a harmonic analysis and backtest filters using the filter and sizing tool. Contingency analysis. Define component outages and failure scenarios. Model N-1 and N-2 contingencies. Reliability assessment. Calculate failure rate of various elements, as well as system reliability indices and customer-oriented indices such as SAFI, SADI, KADI. Uh, tr uh, railway traction power. Train power simulation e-tracks used for designing, analysis, and managing AC and DC railway infrastructure. Transient stability. Model system disturbances such as load shedding, fast bus transfers, and relay fault clearing to optimize overall system frequency and stability after a disturbance. And electromagnetic transient and co-simulation. De dedicated EMT program for the simulation and analysis of power system transients EMT COSIM enables co-simulation of frequency, EMT, and phasers, transient stability, time domains to collectively solve large complex systems with higher fidelity. Let's now take a look at a brief demonstration for some of these. Let's now take a look at some of these analyses being performed right on ETAP. Let's begin by going over the time domain load flow. As you can see, the, the toolbar, the analysis toolbar up here, contains the different study modes from short circuit analysis to arc flash to harmonics, transient stability, protection and coordination, a protection relay, DC load flow, DC short circuit, DC arc flash, battery sizing and discharge, unbalanced load flow, and finally, time domain load flow. So we click on the time domain load flow and the first thing I'd like to show everyone is how we're going to attach the um, source information as well as the loading information. So here's, here's a quick overview of what a solar PV source looks like. This is uh, data that was collected over a one week period at one hour intervals and it provides the input uh, with temperature versus radiance versus the time. So this is actually going to be the input for the sample PV. In the same manner, we're going to have a similar one for different loading characteristics at various loading locations. So 
Let's go ahead and um, look at the study case for the time domain load flow. You'll notice that you're, you'll notice that you're able to include events such as on January 2nd, we're going to open a circuit breaker. And then two days later on January 4th, we're going to do a load impact of 50% to lump number two. Uh, most importantly, it allows you to select the time series load flow time period from and to, and it provides you with a path folder where you could select where the um, where this information is saved, where the source and loading information over time is saved. So essentially what this uh, analysis is going to do is it's going to take each one of these rows and do an iterative solution between all of these source information and loading as a period of, as a function of time and provide us with a, a time domain or time series power flow and graph it for us. So let's uh, begin the simulation. I'm going to run time domain load flow. And this is extremely useful for renewable projects because the, the sun, the wind, right, is um, changes over time as well as the loading characteristics. And for loading, we have typically historical data for summer, for winter. So now let's take a look at using the, the plot analyzer to this time period. So let's take a look at one of my buses, um, sub three, and let's take a look at what the loading is doing, for example, over, over that one week period. So the, re the, um, the graph is being generated. Here's the graph. So you could see um, on the bottom here, we have starting from January 1st, January 2nd, this is the X axis, January 3rd, all the way through January 7th. And it's um, on the Y axis, we have the loading in percentage. And as you could see between um, the, the solar PV, the wind, and also the loading over time, you could see the different, um, the different loading profiles. And what you see here, these dots are essentially the events, right? This, this is the, uh, on January 2nd, um, we open a circuit breaker, and here on January the 4th, we did a, a, an impact of a, a lump load. So it's a, it's a very clean and very professional way to export your uh, reports. <clears throat> now, let's all now take a look at um, uh, motor starting analysis. So in the same way that we um, went over to the time domain load flow, let's go back to the motor acceleration. So this is a transient motor. We're going to perform a transient motor starting. And the first thing I'd like to do is show you the um, how we enter some of this information. So um, the single line diagram is organized in composite into, into the main. This is the main power distribution of the system. I'm going to click on this composite network to show you a little bit more detail for this particular uh, substation location. So let's take a look at this particular 500 horsepower medium voltage, uh, 41, uh, 5 kV rated uh, pump. And we are going to double click on it, show you the pretty standard nameplate. Um, and if I go over to the model, uh, ETAP actually allows you to input the motor dynamic characteristics in three different formats. Number one is the equivalent circuit model, which is what you see here, where if the manufacturer provides you with the time and impedance constants, you can actually put that together. Uh, number two is the uh, characteristic curve. So that's what you see over on the right hand side. Uh, the manufacturer, most of the time nowadays, they provide these curves. <clears throat> They've, they're starting to move away from the equivalent circuit. So now usually what you get is these curves either in Excel or in uh, printed format. And it's essentially the speed <clears throat> versus the torque, um, which is the one uh, on, top, uh, on top, torque versus the speed 
uh, in the middle in green it's the <coughs> current versus the speed and sometimes um, but not all the time given is the percent power factor versus the speed and if these uh, curves are, are um, also uh, included as part of the uh, documentation that you have for the motor you can actually enter them and the third way that you can come up with uh, equip uh, the uh, characteristics dynamic characteristics for a motor so for example if you've exhausted all the options uh, contacted the manufacturer they're unable to provide you with uh, either an equivalent circuit or curves maybe the manufacturer is out of service maybe you don't have uh, any means to contact the manufacturer there is the parameter estimation uh, way and essentially what parameter estimation will do is uh, as you could see it'll automatically based on the nameplate information it will actually estimate um, an equivalent circuit for for the for the motor provide you with uh, the corresponding characteristic curves so that you're able to do or perform the dynamic motor starting. So it's a very, it's an extremely useful tool, especially for those instances where you don't have any information. So going, going back to now the, uh, the simulation, um, I'd like to open the study case now, show you the events that are gonna take place. So we at uh, 100 milliseconds, as you could see on, there are three events. So at 100 milliseconds, we're starting uh, two motors, uh, synchronous motor and uh, pump number one, which is what we're seeing here. Um, 700 uh, milliseconds later, or 800 milliseconds total, uh, we're going to bring a static load online. And then at four seconds, we're going to start one more uh, low voltage motor at, uh, at, uh, four, uh, uh, connected to a 480 volt location, it's 200 horsepower and the the total simulation time is uh, going to be five seconds so uh, after we set up the, the study case with the events like that we're going to click on run dynamic motor starting and here is the uh, action view so i could step through the different events so here is where we start the the uh, the two motors at 100 milliseconds at 800 milliseconds, there's a load that gets switched on, and at four seconds, the next one. But it actually would make more sense if we take a look at the um, uh, the actual curve. So let's take a look at the current for pump number one. So as you could see here, at 100 milliseconds, uh, we see the lock rotor current, so approximately 500 times of the full load amps. Um, about a one second later, this motor actually starts. It's partially loaded. That's why you see this ramp going up from about 40% uh, loaded to about 90% loaded. And we can actually go one step further and plot this on a, uh, a time characteristic curve. So. Um, I'm going to select the, the protection curve or the protection branch for this particular motor. I will then send it to or create a star view like so. And I'm actually going to combine these two curves so it's easier for us to visualize. And what we're looking at right here is the following. Um, we have a uh, we have the motor starting curve but this is an approximation and let me show you how it's an approximation because essentially what we're saying is uh, plot the lock rotor current which is this section with an asymmetrical component and at 2.5 seconds transition to full load amps and this is essentially the option that you see here. So what I'm going to do is, in fact, I'm going to uncheck this option and I'm going to, over on the right hand side, select the acceleration study. This, this is coming from the actual um, stu st study that we, dynamic uh, uh, study that we just performed. So I'm going to click OK and we get to see the actual 
dynamic starting curve for this particular motor. So it's based on what we did. So you could see here how the motor begins to ramp up, partially loaded. The motor starts right here. There's a small delay and it begins of about one second and it begins to ramp up from 40% loaded to about 90% loaded. And then the motor starts. So once you have this, you'll notice that you have um, probably some adjustments to do on your protection. So I just wanted to highlight how easy it is to perform a uh, dynamic motor starting and put that information into uh, protection and coordination. Um, next, I like to go over um, harmonic analysis. So what, what I like to do is I'm going to switch over uh, to harmonic analysis and just uh, kind of show you um, how easy it is to enter, for example, um, harmonic sources to a VFD drive. So I found a VFD drive here on my system. I head over to harmonic analysis and you'll notice that the library has a very comprehensive library of both manufacturer provided um, source information as well as IEEE typical 6, 12, 18 pulse. So uh, once you have uh, here's another variable speed drive. There's the harmonic source. Uh, it's a 12 pulse um, a VFD. If I go into this particular location that has, for example, a, a charger and a UPS, you can also see, for example, that these are harmonic sources. This is a typical IEEE 12 pulse. So all of these harmonic sources actually will have an impact on my total harmonic distortion. So for that, we're going to go ahead and run a harmonics load flow like this. And you notice that at each location, we have a total harmonic distortion. So uh, at the point of common coupling, my total harmonic distortion is 3.15. Uh, and if I go down into my 4160 volt location, there's a total harmonic distortion here of about 7%. Um, uh, another additional item is that if you are trying to comply with the IEEE 519, for example, uh, you can go into your uh, point of common coupling or main bus. You could head over to the harmonics tab and you could select the category. In this case, this is the PCC or point of common coupling. And I want to set my limits based on the IEEE 519 standard. So for this particular voltage, uh, my total harmonic voltage uh, should be no more than 5% and total current distortion to be no more than 3%. And if I was to uh, surpass those limits, uh, I can actually, ETAP would actually alert me right here on the alert view um, for, that, for those locations that exceed the limit. So my point of common coupling is not exceeding the limit. However, I do have some buses, as I mentioned earlier, uh, downstream that have exceeded the limit. So for that we can actually uh, jump into filter design and actually um, backtest some filters. Now I would like to move to uh, transient stability analysis. So from harmonics I'm going to switch over to the just to the right where is transient stability. And I'd like to show you how to perform two different um, disturbances. The first one is going to be we're going to fault this uh, we're going to apply a fault here at the at the main bus and then within a hundred second milliseconds there the, the recloser up here is going to clear it so let me let me show you um, how the events are going to play for this so here is uh, the system fault at 100 milliseconds on my main bus location which is just to the left here and then 200 milliseconds later it's going to uh, clear and I want to see what the system frequency is going to be for that. So I'll go ahead and run my transient stability. I will uh, look at the events right here. So I'm going to step through the actions. So here is the fault. You'll notice that as I apply the fault, the voltage drops here at to zero kV on the main bus. And then 100 milliseconds later, um, that uh, fault is removed, so it's clear. And then you could. See, uh, I want to now let take a look at what the system frequency is doing. 
So I will take a look at uh, sub 2A because uh, this synchronous motor here is actually uh, critical. So I want to see if my load shedding would actually activate that. So I'm going to head over to bus sub 2A. I want to look at my frequency. And here you could see that it does not go above um, the 2% that I have the frequency relay set to. So th there's definitely that that um, damping effect. Uh, you could see how the frequency reacts, but it's not sufficient that it'll trigger my 2% um, load shedding setting for, for this particular relay. Uh, I like to do one, just one more um, disturbance, and that is going to be, we are going to do a fast bus transfer um, in this particular location. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna have uh, a fault in this location. So this transformer is going to be completely isolated. So CB2, CB11 are going to uh, quickly open. And then within 50 milliseconds, we're going to close this tie and we're going to see what the system stability and the frequency again is on this critical bus sub 2A. Um, let's go ahead and do that. So uh, we, what we're going to do is I'm going to select the events. So the events are as follows. At 100 milliseconds, we're going to open CB2. As you can see it highlighted on the screen, we're going to open CB11. And then just 50 milliseconds later, so 150 milliseconds, what we're going to do is we're going to close that tie, CB25. So let's go ahead and perform this simulation. All right. So here is the, uh, the actions. There, there it is. Um, opening of, uh, there is isolating that transformer. This whole side becomes de-energized, that's why you see it green. And then 50 milliseconds later, that tie uh, closes, uh, restoring power to that critical load. So now let's take a look at what the um, system freq of, or the bus frequency is looking at for that particular location. So we're gonna open up the, the frequency graph for that. And we can see here that um, it, 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 it actually never went above uh, uh, a quarter of a percentage on the, uh, for my percentage as, uh, of frequency. So uh, although we can see here the, uh, the, the effect that particular fast bus transfer had, uh, it, it had no impact on activating my load shedding again. So it's a, it's a very uh, professional way to verify in load shedding settings. So with that, uh, I would like to talk about the conclusion. As I mentioned earlier, the scope of this presentation is the ETAP Design and Analysis Foundation, which are the modules that Jeremy and I covered. However, that is just the beginning of the electrical digital twin. Here is a quick overview of the solutions that become available when you add operations data from field devices to an existing electrical model. A model-driven electrical SCADA with state estimation provides the ability to monitor branch locations that have no hardware metering devices, locations that would otherwise be blind to hardware-only based solutions, predictive power system analysis, load forecasting, load management, Generator management, eProtect, protected or protected device relay asset management, outage playback for root cost analysis, and power distribution operator training simulator. In conclusion, the modeling of a network for design and analysis is the foundation for an electrical digital twin and the beginning of a digital transformation journey that allows you to take full advantage of model-driven operation and automation solutions such as PSMS and predictive power system analysis, model-driven electrical SCADA, OTS, operator training simulator, and eProtect, protected device relay asset management solution. Thank you for your time and we look forward to hearing from you.